You know, today we're going to look at a couple stories of uh, some people that were desperate, absolutely desperate. You know, when you're desperate and you need help, where are you going to go? There's some people that talk about how it's just important to have faith. But you know what? The honest truth is having faith isn't as important as making sure where you put your faith is something that someone that can help you. I read the story of a little girl. She was just a few weeks old and she became ill. And um, she had some apparently some kind of an infection in her eyes. And so the family went to their family doctor and he was out of town. And so what they did is uh, they consulted with another guy that was kind of filling in for him. And this, this guy said, what, what you need to do is you need to make some hot mustard uh, poultices and apply them to this little baby's eyes. And so they did that. And this guy actually was not a doctor at all. He was a charlatan. I mean, he, he, he didn't know what he was doing. And this hot mustard poultice that they put on their little girl made her blind. Now, you may know who this little girl is. Her name is Fanny Crosby. Fanny Crosby lived her entire life blind. And yet that didn't stop her from fulfilling her, from fulfilling her mission. She is probably the most prolific American hymn, hymn writer in our history. She has written over 8,000 hymns. Some of them you may recognize. I do. Blessed Assurance. Anybody remember that one? Um, the Old Rugged Cross. Rescue the Perishing. To God be the Glory. Praise him, praise him, or I am thine, O Lord. But what a tragedy. These parents in their desperation go to a guy that thought was a doctor. Turns out he didn't even know anything about medicine. Um, where are we going to go when we're in, in a desperate situation? Do we have a God in heaven who cares about those moments where we are desperate? Is he willing to help? Is he willing to intervene? Can, can, does he even care? And, you know, when we study the book of Mark, God reveals himself to be a God who does care. A God who can help. A God who is worthy of our faith and our trust. So in Matthew chapter 5, we're going to encounter three people. Number one, a desperate father with a sick child. A desperate woman who has had chronic illness and lastly the desperation of death you know i'm amazed at um when i talk to people where people actually get their theology i remember at a small group one time at my house there was this young guy he was an awesome guy and he sat there and as we were commenting on the passage we were discussing he says, now, I can't remember if I heard this in a movie or if it's in a Bible. And then he made a statement. And that's actually the way most people think nowadays. I'm not, how many people have I encountered who tell me what they think about the life after death because they watched a Disney movie? Um, it's pretty important where we put our, where we put our faith. Mark writes about Jesus, the Son of God, and he tells stories that will describe his character, his power, and his mission. And so in this passage, we read about these desperate people under these, in these de desperate circumstances. And so let's begin with the first one. In Mark 5, 21, it's about a desperate father. And here's how the story goes. Now, when Jesus had crossed again by boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to him, and he was by the sea. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet. Look at this. He fell at his feet and begged him earnestly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hand, hands on her that she may be healed and she will live. So Jesus went with him and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. Now, this father is identified as a ruler of the synagogue. He was in a prominent position. Now, it didn't mean that he was a rabbi or a teacher, but he was kind of like the official administrator of the synagogue properties. He took care of the building. You know, it, administration is very important. He also took care of the central thing in the synagogue that was a part of the worship, and that was the scrolls. 
Now, already at this point in Jesus' ministry, Jesus had fallen out of favor with the religious community and the religious leaders. I mean, they had decided that Jesus was a blasphemer. And, and the things that uh, he had done in healing crossed the line, like healing a man with a withered hand on the Sabbath day. Uh, I mean, they, they were just nitpicking Jesus. They, they were so about following their rules and regulations and keeping their system of power and authority in place. They, they were able to overlook the incredible healings and help that Jesus was giving. They had decided that Jesus was a blasphemer and that he should be killed. This is already happening behind the scenes. So when Jairus decides... In his moment of desperation, he's going he's gonna to run past the crowd, fall at the feet of Jesus, and beg him to please come and help his little daughter who was sick and at the point of death. He risked his career. He now would anger the people that he answered to. His bosses were the people that hated Jesus. But as he evaluated all things, he was so desperate because he loved his little girl so much. And nobody could help her. And he had watched Jesus. And he had listened to Jesus. And he had decided, I think Jesus can help her. I wonder if he will. At this point, I'm willing to risk it all and put my faith in Jesus. His was a radical, costly demonstration of faith. He had so much to lose by bowing publicly before Jesus and asking for his help. But that's what faith requires. In order for us to have faith, we're, we're going to have to risk it all. You can't have faith in Jesus and others. I had a Hindu neighbor one time in the Philippines, and they would say things as, I mean, we, we shared the gospel several times. And there was one time when, when this, this lady says to me, you know, we, we will take Jesus also to be part of our gods. And I said, you know, that's not the way it works with Jesus. He is the God of gods. He is the sovereign God of heaven and earth. You, he, he can't be one of many. He has to be the one. And at that, she just wasn't able to go all the way. Um, you know, faith is exercised when we don't know what's going to happen. In spite of the uncertainty of our prayers, we choose to put our hope in the power of Jesus. That's what this man was doing. He was going to ask Jesus for help. You know, I don't know what your desperation is today, what you need help with. What is the darkness of your soul that you deal with? What is the problem you can't seem to overcome? What's going on in your life? Where are you going to find hope? Who can help you? Who cares enough about you to help you? And we read through the Gospels and we discover that there is this man, Jesus, who Mark says he is the Son of God. But not only that, he's not only full of power, but he is compassionate and caring and willing to intervene. And he's willing to help the desperate man. Now, the story continues as Jesus says to this man who's begging him to come to his house and lay his hands on his sick daughter... It goes on in verse 25. Now a certain woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things from many physicians, she had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. This woman has a chronic illness. I mean, for 12 years, I mean, she's weak, she's weary, she suffers all the time. She's ex explored every option for a treatment. She's gone to all the physicians she can think of, and as much as they tried to help, no one was able to help her, and she remained with this disease or this condition. And as a, as a matter of fact, because she had an issue of blood, she, she was considered ceremonial unclean. For all of these years, she had not been able to worship in the synagogue anymore. She couldn't really be part of normal society. She was considered unclean, despised. She was an outcast. 
She wasn't even supposed to be in this crowd in the first place. I mean, it was wrong for her to attempt to touch Jesus' garment. She knew this, but this woman was desperate, and she was losing hope. And so she courageously moves into the throng of people, hoping to get close enough to Jesus to touch, listen to this, that's a beautiful euphemism, the hem of his garment. She had heard enough about Jesus to believe that what he taught was powerful and real. And she had seen his compassionate heart to heal and intervene in the lives of so many people. And with all of her strength, she musters what she can, all, all of it together, so that she can go and get close enough just to touch the hem of his garment. She wasn't worthy to come into a real conversation. You know, I don't know what makes you desperate today, but the testimony of the Gospel of Mark is that Jesus is a kind, compassionate man who is God in the flesh. When you're pressed, when you're desperate, you don't have to despair. You can cry out to Jesus. I mean, cry out to Jesus. You, you, you don't have to live in a hopeless situation. Jesus came to this broken and depressed world with hope and healing and a promise of resurrection. I don't know what your struggle is today. Sometimes I think we're so good at not recognizing what is on our hearts and in our minds that drag us down and makes us feel desperate. That we can put on a smile and keep on going. But I'm here to say there is another alternative and that is we can go to Jesus. Like today. In a few minutes we're going to have what we call our time of extended extended time of prayer. I want to invite you. What, what is the thing you need help with? Why don't you come? Why don't you come? And we'll pray with you. We, we will pray uh, about that issue. We'll just be there with you. Our solution is not a religious system. So many people say, well, tell me which religion is correct. You know, that's, that's kind of a false question because the gospel doesn't talk about a religious system. People love to pit one denomination against another and, and they're looking for, and, and, and the problem with all of that is the hope that is sort of expressed is if I get into the right church, if I have the right label and the right tag, then maybe that's the answer. And the, that is not the answer. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. The, the, the answer to our needs is a personal relationship, an ongoing walking with Jesus. That's what's going to change us. Psalm 34, 18 um, when we are desperate, this is, this is how God has already declared. Before you get to the New Testament, the Lord is near to those who have a broken heart. You got a broken heart today? Are you so discouraged? The Lord, did you know that the Lord is not, he's not annoyed by you? He's not freaking out because, oh great, please leave me alone, Mr. Needy. No. He is near to those who have a broken heart and saves such as have a contrite spirit. The story of Jesus is that God has come near. He cares. 1 Peter 5, 6, Therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Jesus, another great invitation in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Hebrews chapter 4, describing the great high priest who has gone into the heavens. In verse 15, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. This woman is the perfect example of someone who is desperate and decides, I have found a man who can help me. And so I'm going to risk everything. And she runs to Jesus. 
in verse 29, immediately the fountain of blood was dried up and she felt her body, in her body, that she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched, who touched my clothes? But his disciples said to him, you see the multitude thronging you and you say, who touched me? Okay, so the disciples still don't get it that Jesus is God. And did you know that when God asks a question, he's not really looking for more information. Do you think Jesus didn't know who this lady was? Do you think Jesus needed their help to figure out who in the world touched me? I mean, there were probably hundreds of people that were, that were touching him. Uh, he, he turns and he says, who touched me? You know what he was doing? He, he was saying, I know the woman who touched me who just got healed. I know what I'm doing. I know the care and compassion that I just have extended to this woman. And I don't want to leave her anonymous in the crowd. So, disciples, who touched me? And he looked around to see her uh, who, had, who had done this thing. Now, if you could imagine, here he goes on, the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. I mean, this woman didn't have it. Here she was unclean. She, she, for 12 years, she was not allowed to be in the public. She wasn't allowed to touch people, go to the synagogue. She was approaching this this Jesus, this man Jesus who was shaking up the, the country, he didn't know if he would scold her. But he does the opposite of scolding her. He says to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. I, I just want to say something. You know, sometimes we, I've heard that statement taken out of this context and applied in such a way that it says that if you have enough faith, you will be healed. And if you're not being healed, that means you don't have enough faith. And I'm here to say that is not a proper interpretation. He's making the observation that this woman, she risked it all and she went to Jesus and she was believing with everything she had that he was her only and last hope for healing. And so she risked it all. I've, I've, I've talked to people that said that they prayed for healing and they didn't get it and they were told, well, you don't have enough faith. You know, that's a subtle way to shift the power and the healing from the power of God to my power to have enough faith. You see what that is? It's very subtle. It's very dangerous. But he was saying, hey, daughter, you came to me. You've been watching me. You put your hope in me. And I'm worthy of your hope. And because you did, your faith has saved you. I, I've healed you. Now Jesus is making a public declaration, declaration to this woman. Um, and I, there's a couple things going on. First of all, um, I don't think Jesus does anonymous healing, okay? He stopped the train... He said, stop it. Who touched me? He knew who touched him. He knew her name. He knew her story. He, he was God. He knew everything about her. But he wants the crowd to know it. And more importantly, he wants this woman to know. Hey, listen. I know who you are. I intentionally have healed you because I care about you. And I love you. And I've come for you. That was the character of Jesus. She put her faith and trust in Jesus. And she was healed. And publicly he says, while you have been feeling like an outcast, like you are unworthy and of little value for 12 years, I'm here to declare as the son of God, you are loved and valued and known and I want everybody to know it and the other thing he did was he uh, he proclaimed at that very moment in public this woman is whole and healed and she is clean he reintroduced her to society because he had, he had done something for her 
you know, <clears throat> one of the most important things that we can do is, and, and I think this is sometimes for me has been a problem. I accepted Christ when I was a little boy. And I'm like, you know, I hear people preach and I've been to many church services, believe me. My dad was a preacher. We were there every time a service was going on and more. If church attendance gets you in good standing with God, I am so good. One day we were staying with my grandparents. And we had been traveling the country with my parents. It was literally almost in church every night of the week because we were going to missions conferences. I mean, that was back in the day when there was a Monday service, a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. I mean, we were in church so much. My brother and I were so saturated with church attendance. We, we just could hardly stand it. Is that proper for me to say, you know, I'm a preacher, right? Not your... So we, we go stay with my grandparents. And um, so we got up early. And we were out at the barn checking out the ponies and looking around the bar and climbing up into the hayloft and we're having a great time. And all of a sudden I said to my brother, hey, listen, it's, it's, a, it's about time to go to church. We're probably going to have to go to church. And he says to me, oh, Eddie, I'm not going to church. I am so caught up. I, I don't have to go to church for six months. I said, well, Greg, let's just see if grandma will buy that. <laughs> she didn't. We went to church that day. Jesus meets this woman. And what, what, my problem is sometimes I get into the just the routine. And I love routine. I think it's so important. When in doubt, go for the routine. But if you can, remember why you do what you do. And learn to practice the presence of God. I come to church just like you on Sunday and with every song, I decide if I'm going to sing or ignore or I'm going to worship. I heard of a mother who said, <clears throat> in response to the fact that so many people believe in a God who is out there. But they really don't know about a God who is in here. And this mother trying to teach her kids to practice the presence of God. She, she stopped asking her kids, how was your day? And she did something she thought was more helpful. She tucked her children into bed each night and she would ask them this question. Hey, where did you see God today? Where did you meet God along this day? Um, and one would answer, well, uh, you know, my teacher helped me. I, I kind of feel like that's that's God helping me out too. And one, one of her children said, well, I saw a homeless person in the park and, 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 I, and I, I was sorry for them. And, and I, you know, that was kind of God's compassion that I was feeling. And, and then one of them said, well, I, you know, I saw this tree with a lot of flowers on it. How beautiful. It's like God was displaying his glory and the beauty of that tree. And after they all finished telling her where they met God that day, she would tell them where she met God that day too practicing the presence of God. So this woman, her life was completely changed. But in 35, remember what he's doing. He's going with Jairus to his house because his daughter, who is dying, needs him. While he was speaking, some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house and said, Jairus, your daughter's dead. Don't, why trouble the teacher any further? It's over. I mean, Jairus in that moment goes from a very, very tough situation to an impossible situation because it's over. His daughter has died. That's the report. And in those moments, there's this kind of finality. He surely was struggling. You know, when you get that kind of news, you don't know how to be, you don't know how to think, you don't know what to say or how to feel. And you know what Jesus says? He says to Jairus, hey, 
Do not be afraid. Only believe. Jairus, I'm the God who can heal. But I've got more to tell you. I'm also the God who has conquered death. Jesus as God, transcendent in his being and power, knows no boundaries. Death could not hold him. Jesus pushes the boundaries of their understanding of his power. And he declares that he can still do something. He can deliver his little girl. Don't worry about the report that she is dead. He had come to not only defeat sin and sickness, but even death and the grave itself. And that's why in John 11, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? I love that verse. I recite that verse to, to myself a lot. I do funerals. And so sad. I did one yesterday. And the sadness of losing an infant child is overwhelming. But even the parents spoke of the fact that a grand reunion is coming because Jesus has overcome even death. As soon as Jesus heard um, the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not be afraid, only believe. And he permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, John, um, the brother of James. And then he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and he saw a tumult of those who wept and wailed loudly. When he came in, he said to them, why make this commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. Now, in, in that day, if you were prominent or wealthy, or even if you were poor, you would hire a mourner to begin the mourning until, you know, the, 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 the burial. Well, I mean, this guy was a, you know, he was a well-placed man, and the mourners had already started gathering. There was a plan in place, and before he gets home, the mourners are there. These paid mourners are, are contributing to the time of lament and grief. And Jesus walks in, and he, he tells them, he says, what, what, all this, what is this, all this commotion about? And, and he says to them, she's not dead, she's just sleeping. And it was such an absurd statement that the mourners started laughing at Jesus. And he says, please send everybody out. Send them out. And he took the mother and the father, Peter, James, and John, inside to where the girl was laying. And he, he told her to get up. You know why? Because Jesus had come to invade the brokenness and the sadness and the lostness of planet Earth and humanity's existence. And part of his agenda was that he was going to move us to a place like Revelation 21, 4 says, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain. The former things have passed away. This is our blessed hope. So he goes to where the child is, and, and he, he, he takes the little girl. She's 12 years old. 12 years old, takes her by the hand, and he says, Talitha kumi. Interestingly, Mark uses Aramaic, not Hebrew, not Greek, but the vernacular of the day, Aramaic. He uses a very regular, ordinary, exceedingly ordinary statement. Little girl, get up. Okay, I, I point that out because don't you be looking for some kind of incantation or special magic healing words. He didn't need any kind of anything more than just an ordinary, hey, little girl, get up. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't there a tenderness in that moment? And she gets up. 
What do you think her parents are thinking at that moment? Their hearts have got to be exploding with joy. They look at Jesus beside them and they, they had to conclude, surely he is the son of God, the savior of the world. I will trust him. I'm going to follow him. He takes on our greatest enemy, death itself, and he replaces it with eternal life. A few years ago, I was at Boston, and I was attending a pastor's meeting. We were talking about how that we can partner together to help plant more churches that our country so desperately needs. And one night, we went to Fenway Park, Park uh, to watch a, the, the Boston Red Sox play. Now, Fenway, anybody here ever been to Fenway? There, there's some of you who have, okay. Fenway is this old ballpark. I mean, it's, it is so old. The chairs are so close together. I mean, they're so close together. Try as you can to be as small as you can. You're going to feel the guy's leg next to you no matter what you do, if you know what I'm saying. So, you know, we're, we're all sitting there, and here's this guy next to me. And so uh, we begin to talk, and, and I, I, I said, um, so are you, are you from Boston? He says, no, I'm not, actually. He says, I just flew in. Uh, my son lives here in Boston. I'm from Salt Lake City. And, and then he says, hey, you know what? Really sad news about what happened last night here in Fenway, that the lady that was hit by a flying bat and almost died. Man, that's just too bad. You never know when your time is going to come and it's going to all be uh, over and nothing more, no life after death. He, then he asked me, if I was from Boston, I told him, no, I wasn't from Boston. And uh, he says, uh, well, what are you doing here? I said, well, I'm, I'm actually a pastor and I'm going to be speaking in a church. And, you know, that usually turns the conversation. I try my best to not tell them I'm a pastor. But, you know, what are you, gonna be, what are you here for? Well, I'm speaking in a church. That kind of gives it away. And then he, he looks at me and he says, so um, what do you think? What do you think about death and life beyond? You think there could be something? I said, well, you know, there was a man named Jesus who died and rose again. And he certainly said there was more after death. You just have to prepare for it. I said, have you, have you ever read the Gospels? He said, no. I said, you know, on the off chance, <laughs> that Jesus said something about this, I'd encourage you to read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and just see what you discover. It was a ball game. He didn't want to go into much more conversation. But with all my heart, I prayed, Lord, I pray that he'll go home maybe in the moments where he's wondering about whether there's life after death. He will, um, he'll open the Gospels. It's, it's not about um, a religious system, a denomination. It's about finding the man whose name is Jesus, who is God, who has come to save us, to give us eternal life. So I don't know if you're desperate today about something. Surely you got something going on in your life. I've noticed in my life it seems like I'm either in a, in a, in a situation or coming out of one or getting ready to go into another one. I don't know when that's going to happen. But and the great thing is that we have an advocate who has come to help us in our times of desperation. He would help you today if you'd ask him. We're going to have our time of extended prayer. What does that mean? That means we want you, no matter what you're going through, to come and let us pray with you. You don't have to share much detail. Just I'm going through something is good enough. But when you come to Jesus, I'm not asking you to come to this church. I'm not asking you to join a denomination. I'm asking you to believe that God has come. His name was Jesus. And he's honored when you ask him for help. 